Hello, St. Peter's. Welcome back to another fun Friday. We are reading our chapter series on week four already. Can you believe it? We just started October yesterday and we're getting close. We have a couple more weeks with our friend Clementine. So make sure you gather up all your friends. Who do we have? Ralph, Magic Monkey, Daisy, and our pig of joy is here with her jar of joy ready to spread some joy at the end. So sit back and relax. I know you've done a lot of work this week. Our in-school learners have done a lot. Our virtual learners are still going strong. We're proud of you all. Thank you for working so hard. So let's take a few minutes and read the next couple chapters of Clementine. Remember, last time Clementine was having a very bad time. Margaret just got her braces, or her bracelets, as she likes to call them. And Clementine was jealous of that, so she wanted to get her own. Even though her mom tried to tell her that braces do kind of hurt sometimes. It's not all that great. Well, then, on the bus, Margaret and Clementine decided maybe to try to glue Clementine, Clementine's hair onto Margaret's head. That, of course, landed her back once again in the principal's office, where finally the principal just said, what is going on? That's when Clementine really got angry. She kind of let loose about all these things that were bothering her about Margaret, you, about, you know, things in her birthday party and her present and her cake and Margaret's trying to look like her. She just wasn't having a very good day. So her dad tried to cheer her up by battling those pigeons out in front of their apartment building. And the very last thing we heard from Clementine was, what are we gonna do? Her dad didn't know either. But just like today being Friday, Clementine is in Friday in her story. That's where we're gonna pick up. Let's see, here's the picture at the start, at the start of the chapter. Does it look like Clementine's Friday is going to be any better than her Thursday? I don't know. That's quite a silly picture. Here we go. I knew Friday was going to be a bad day right from the beginning because there were clear parts in my eggs. I can't eat eggs if they had clear parts, I reminded my mother. Eat around them, she said. Just eat the yellow parts and the white parts. But I couldn't because the clear parts had touched the, ye the yellow parts and the white parts. Uh, so all I had was toast. Have you got all your stuff? My dad asked as I was leaving. Of course, I said, right in my backpack. But when I went to show him my homework, three sentences about the planet Saturn, which I had decorated with a picture of some squirrels I'd seen in the park, it wasn't there. Better go check the black hole, he said. I gave my dad a that's not funny look, but I went back to my room to check. The black hole is what my dad calls the place under my bed. He says things mysteriously disappear there. I do not think fathers should be comedians. My homework paper was not under my bed. And the rest of the day got worse. On the bus, Margaret walked right past our usual seat and sat down next to Amanda Lee, even though all Amanda Lee can talk about is going to the mall, which is so boring. Plus, anyone with a name as beautiful as Amanda Lee probably made it up. Here is a picture of Margaret with her short hair sitting next to Amanda Lee on the bus. How do you think Clementine feels about that? Mm, she sounds kind of angry, doesn't she? Then as soon as I got to school, the teacher said, the following students are excused from recess so they can catch up on their journal writing. And I was one of the following students. Three times during journal writing, the teacher said, Clementine, you need to pay attention. And every time he said it, I was paying attention. I was paying attention out the window where the fourth graders were playing pickle in the middle. Whenever the ball came anywhere near Margaret and Amanda Lee, they grabbed each other and shrieked like they were being murdered. 
which everyone knows means we are best friends. When my teacher moved my seat away from the window, I was G-L-A-D glad. And I wrote all over my journal page, I don't care, so hard that my pencil broke. She was so angry. Here's a picture of her journal. Looks really angry scribbling, isn't it? She's mad. When I got home from school, I was planning on going straight to my room to draw a picture of me with a new best friend. But my dad was putting on his raincoat and it was not raining out. Fighting pigeons is not for the weak hearted, he said. It takes superhuman courage and resourcefulness and cleverness. When my dad talks like this, it means he has a new idea. You have another battle plan, I asked. Yep, he answered, and it's a doozy. I'll probably be promoted to general for this one. You already are the general, remember? Oh, right. I'm so modest, I sometimes forget. Well, I bet I get the Medal of Honor. Dad, I might even be knighted for this one. Dad, I said, sometimes my dad needs help staying serious. So what is the new battle plan? My dad looked around like he thought there might be spies sneaking up on us. Then he bent over and whispered in my ear, psychological warfare. Psychological warfare. That means kind of like messing with your mind. He's going to try to play a trick on those pigeons. This sounded like a good one, so I followed him out and sat on the steps to watch. I could do that drawing later. First, my dad hosed off the sidewalk, then sprayed the pigeons until they flew away. All the time, he was muttering things like, Oh, they're crafty, all right, but I'm craftier. And it's a little known fact that pigeons were the eighth deadly plague to visit Egypt. Then he pulled a brown plastic owl from a bag. He got a ladder and climbed up and put the owl right on top of the lion's head over the lobby door. I asked him what that was for. The pigeons will take one look at that owl and then they'll head for the hills. Well, for another building. Pigeons are deathly afraid of owls. Yep, I'll probably be knighted. It's plastic, I reminded him. But the pigeon doesn't know that. That's the brilliance of my plan. I didn't see what was so brilliant. I didn't see how a little plastic owl was going to frighten off a flock of pigeons who fought over who would get to sit on the head of a roaring lion. And while, I, and while we stood there, Dad admiring his brilliant battle plan and me worrying about it, the pigeons came back. They settled on their regular perches all over the front of our building, except for a few who decided to sit on the owl's head. <sighs> what my dad needed was something real. Polka Dottie would have scared them off. Do you remember who Polka Dottie is? Yeah, Polka Dottie was the cat that Clementine had, but it died, so she's probably missing her. Dad put the ladder in his raincoat away and came over and sat beside me. You still miss her, don't you, sport? I nodded. I miss seeing her when I get home from school. I miss patting where her fur was so soft under her neck. I miss hearing her purr when I fall asleep. I even miss the smell of her cat food. That's a lot of missing, my dad said. There she is talking to her dad on the stoop. How does she look? A little bit sad, right? She's got her head down, her hands on her knees. And she would have scared off those pigeons, wouldn't she? Absolutely. That was one terrifying cat. Dad, she would have been terrifying two pigeons, I said. And then I had one of the most astounding ideas of my whole career. I jumped up and gave my dad a kiss right where his beard stops being crunchy. Then I ran back into the apartment, went to my bedroom and reached under the mattress where I keep my favorite pictures of polka. Then I ran to the copy shop at the corner. Can you make this bigger, I asked. How big do you want it? The clerk asked back. I took out my wallet and laid all my birthday money on the counter. How big can you make it for this much? 
The clerk counted my money and thought for a minute. I can make that cat the size of a German shepherd for that much money. Perfect, I said. So she's going to blow up a picture of her cat. The size of a German shepherd, that's going to be really big. Then he took the money and the picture of Polka and told me to come back the next day at four. I ran home and let myself into the apartment. My mom and dad were in the kitchen. So here she is listening when she first came home. Her parents don't know she's there yet. So she's going to listen to this conversation right here. One left, my dad said. One's all we need, said my mom. Do you think we should do it? I think so, my dad answered. I think it's time. Okay, my mom said. I'll call tomorrow. One's all we need? I slammed the door behind me so they would know I was there. If they were talking about getting rid of me so they'd only have one kid, the easy one, I wanted them to S-T-O-P stop. Not that I was worried. They probably weren't even talking about me anyway. Shh, my dad said. She's home. <sighs> okay, fine. I was worried. Here is a secret good thing. Sometimes I like write, journal writing at school because I can remind myself of things I might forget when I am a grown up, like that I plan to smoke cigars and I do not plan to get married. Cigars, yes. Husband, no. What if I forget these things? One more thing to remember when I am old, if I ever do get married, which I will not, I will only have one kid, the first one. She is plenty good enough, even if she's the hard one. Nope, no need for another kid, even if he's the easy one. Although thinking about my brother and the idea about my journal gave me an astounding idea on Saturday. Last week, Turnip had to get a shot at the doctor's and he was so mad about it, my parents let him rent a video and eat gummy worms, even though they are usually the Sesame Street and Carrot Sticks kind of parents. So I pretended I had to write in my journal, even though I did it because it was the weekend. And I pretended I was mad about it, so my parents would feel sorry for me too. So here she is, writing in her journal, looking angry as her parents come in. As soon as they came into the room, I scringed my eyebrows down like arrows and stuck my bottom teeth out as far as they could go. Here is a picture of that. And here's what she wrote, she drew in her journal to show her parents. That's a pretty funny face, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If my teeth were pointier, I would have looked fierce like our stone lion. Still, see how mad I looked? But guess what my parents did? Nothing, because they are not so good at paying attention. Excuse me, I said, I am very mad about this journal. May I please have some gummy worms and a video? They stared at me like I had spoken in the secret language Margaret and I use, which I was almost sure I had not. You let Zucchini have gummy worms in a video when he was mad about his shot, I reminded them. First of all, my mother said, your brother's name isn't Zucchini. Second of all, he's three years old. And third of all, my father said, considering all the trouble you got into this week, I don't think it's quite the time for special treats, do you? Okay, fine, I said. But it wasn't. In the afternoon, my mom had to go to her yoga class and my brother had to go to his Saturday play group. My dad was around, but he was up on the second floor taking care of a plumbing issue. Usually on Saturday afternoons, Margaret and I play together. But now Margaret was not my friend anymore. So I had nothing to do, not even eat gummy worms and watch a video for three whole hours until I could go back to get the big polka picture. Then I realized I didn't exactly know where I should put the picture once I got it. What I needed was one of the top windows right in the middle of the building where it would scare off the pigeons. Margaret's apartment was on the fifth floor. 
but I didn't think Margaret's mother was about to let a common criminal use her window. The man who lives on the sixth floor smells like mothballs, so I never visit him. The people who live on the seventh floor were away on vacation while their apartment got painted, which reminded me. I flew up to the seventh floor to see if the painters wanted help yet. Nobody answered the apartment door when I knocked, but the painters' stilts and all their brushes and paint cans were out in the hall. The hall hadn't been painted yet, which gave me a great idea. I could do it for them. Then when they got back on Monday, they'd smack their foreheads and make, wow, I must be dreaming faces. They'd wonder who had done such a great thing until I went up to him and told them, oh, it was just me. Is this a good idea? You think Clementine should try painting the hallway by herself? I don't think so either. I was smiling about all this while I strapped the stilts onto my legs. But when I tried to stand up, I fell right over. I tried again and I fell right over again. Here she is on those stilts, trying to stand up. That is dangerous. 29 times I tried, which was plenty, believe me. So I was all done being there. Whew, that's probably good because she didn't paint the hallway that way. Whew. On the way down, the elevator stopped at the fifth floor. I got a little bit excited when Margaret got in and smiled at me. But then one second later that Amanda Lee got in too. Hi, Clementine. We're going to the mall, Margaret said. I turned around and pretended to be very busy pushing all the buttons until they got off. Then I went to my room and drew a picture of me at the mall with a lot of my new best friends. Finally, it was time to go to the copy shop and I ran all the way, even though I probably had two broken legs from all that falling. When the clerk brought out the picture of Polka Dottie, my heart hurt so much I couldn't breathe for a minute. She looked so beautiful that big and I missed her so much. I quick sucked in some air so I wouldn't faint. And then I said, thank you and took Polka home, being careful not to fold her because she would have hated that. When I got to my building, I looked up through all the pigeons. At the very top of the building was old Mrs. Jacoby's apartment. I tucked the big picture of Polka under my arm, took the elevator to the eighth floor and knocked on Mrs. Jacoby's door. Can you put this in your window, I asked, the one in the middle of your living room? Mrs. Jacoby said, why, certainly, dearie, without even asking why. And suddenly she didn't look so old or so boring. I went to the window and opened it. When I looked down, I could see the backs of a million cooing pigeons. They covered every windowsill, every balcony, every ledge, every brick that stuck out even an inch. In between, I could see the sidewalk in front of the building, still wet from my dad's washing. I guessed this was what my dad meant about seeing things from a different angle, but I didn't understand how it could help. Mrs. Jacoby came over beside me and shook half a box of Cheerios onto the windowsill. The pigeons flapped up in one huge gray cloud and my brain snapped, hey, hey. I ran out of Mrs. Jacoby's apartment and all the way down to my own eight times 12 stairs, which equals 96. Dad, I yelled, what if the pigeons lived on the side of the building instead of in the front? Would that be okay? That would be great, my dad said, a miracle. Except of course, first, you'd have to convince a million pigeons to move. But if I could, would that solve the problem? You wouldn't care if they messed all over the sidewalk in the side alley? Nope, not a bit. Nobody uses it. The alley could be knee deep in pigeon splat and nobody would even notice. Fire away, I'd say. And then I ran all the way back up the stairs to Mrs. Jacoby's apartment and went right inside since the door was still open because that's how fast I was. I'll run for your Cheerios every week, I told her. You won't even have to ask me. 
every day if you want, but will you stop feeding the pigeons from here? Will you feed them from a side window instead? And this is what it looks like when she's feeding the, the pigeons out the window. This actually might be a good idea of Clementine's. I took her into the dining room and showed her a perfect place. Let's start today, I said, and I sprinkled out the rest of the box of Cheerios. And even though pigeons have teeny tiny bird brains, they got the message pretty quick because right away, a big flock of them flapped over. And it was even better for Mrs. Jacoby because this was her dining room. So now she could see those pigeons eating when she was eating. And then I was all done being there. So I ran back home to tell my dad the good news. He, had my mom, he and my mom were in the kitchen starting dinner. So I told them and I told them and I told them. And my dad kept saying, way to go sport. And my mom kept saying, thank goodness. Now you don't have to spend your life cleaning up after those pigeons. They were so happy. But my parents were sneaky too. Somehow while I was telling them about Mrs. Jacoby, one of them slipped me a colander of green beans and brainwashed me into snapping them. Here's the picture of her snapping the beans while she's telling them. She's so excited. I didn't really care though. Seeing the, wow, I must be dreaming faces on my parents was even better than it would have been seeing them on those painters. Unfortunately, they didn't have those faces very long. After dinner, my mother said she'd better get a little work done. Then she went to the cupboard to get her special markers, which were still in Margaret's room. You used my, not my, the permanent, those are for, what were you? It's a very bad sign when my mother can't finish her sentences. Oh, they're at Margaret's, I told her. They're fine, not even chewed on. I will go get them. Oh no, said my father. We'll go get them. I think it's time we had a talk with Margaret's mother anyway. You go sit in your room and think about things. So I went to my room and thought about things like Margaret's mother explaining to my parents about the easy one, hard one rule. There she is. All of a sudden, she was up so high and now she's sad. We're gonna stop right there. Clementine had a really good idea though with those pigeons. So I think maybe things will start turning around for her. What do you think? I love it. We have one more week to go with our Clementine story. Two chapters left. I hope you're loving it just as much as I am. What do you say we spread some joy? How about it, Joy? Let's do it. It's gonna be a beautiful weekend. It's sunny out today. It's getting chilly because it's fall, but as long as we put on sweaters and jackets, we can really have a lot of fun outside still with the beautiful sunny weather. How are we gonna spread some joy this weekend? Perfect. It says, read to someone. So when it's nice and sunny, go outside and play. And if it starts raining or you get too cold and you need to come in and have some warm cider or hot cocoa, sit down, grab a book, read to someone in your house, a grandma or a grandpa, your mom or dad, an older or younger brother or sister. What a great way to spread some joy. You can practice your reading and entertain them at the same time. That's a great way to spread some joy. All right, boys and girls, I hope you enjoyed our next latest installment of Clementine. And come back next week so you can hear how it all ends up. Until then, have a fantastic weekend. Have a wonderful week next week. And I'll see you back here next week on Friday. Keep spreading your joy.